How's everybody doing? You guys ready to start? Give me just one minute here. I'm gonna get rid of this. Uh, this is the Sales Velocity Academy website. By the way, if you haven't seen it, here's kind of how it looks. Sales Velocity Academy, foundational classes, advanced classes, mastery classes, so forth and so on. But anyway, let me get rid of that for now. Uh, I want to go full screen on here so we have the board ready to go and ready to learn, man. So you guys excited? Let's see who's here. Jared Best Mitchell out of Trinidad, man. Good to have you here, man, as always. Look this guy up. Great sales trainer. Always has great content on uh, Instagram. So, hey. Uh, w World War II Wars. Oh, my haddock. Let's begin. I hear you, brother. Herb Wash is in the house. Welcome, Kathy. He says, all right, let me see. R&J Recording Studio Mendoza. Que pasa, Boricua? Todo bien, hermano, todo bien. Glad to be back for some more fine, for some more fire, man. I'm going to give it to you. Fuego, caliente, ahí directo. Uh, Kara Parker, I'm ready. I'm here. All right, I think you guys are going to like today, man. Steve, welcome, man. Craig Ward from Phoenix, Arizona. Whew, it's a dry heat out there, man. It is hot out there, isn't it? Man, it's amazing. But anyway, so today, what I want to do is um, we got uh, buenos, buenas noches from Zizibiz. That's it. Hey, man. Good evening. Good evening. A lot. Oh, now everybody's popping up. Bridget set back. Amit Singh is back. Love to have you guys on here, man. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, today's going to be an interesting topic. I think today, this little subject I have, don't let the title fool you, man. This is going to be really good. And it's going to be short and sweet, so we'll try to keep it easy. Uh, RV Reviews. Hope business is still going well for you guys, man. Uh, let me see. Looking forward to also delivering some good stuff for you guys. Uh, finally able to catch a live stream. Been following you for years, brother. And recommending my, well, my salespeople to you. Looking forward to it. All right. Corporal Critter, man. I love it. And then, here he is, Tarun Badwa. Let me just check one thing real quick here, real quick, before I get started. So I'm looking at my camera, and it looks a little hot. And so, just want to make sure the picture is right. I had to dim myself a little bit. It was too much light coming off my head. Bang, didn't want to glow. This shiny head will do it. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get into this thing right away, because... Um, let me just kind of set the framework up. When I was thinking about this, I said, you know, what's useful to kind of teach that I, that's something that you can use right away. And I thought about storytelling, right? And, you know, some people say story selling, storytelling. It is the ability to tell a good story. And I was listening to, uh, here's a tip. I like to listen to preachers. Like if I, when I go on YouTube, I look for preachers. I don't know why. I just like to listen to them preach. Uh, because they have, you know, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them have like the gift of not only telling stories, but tying it to, you know, something that's relevant. And I was listening to a guy this morning, uh, forgot his name already, but he was really good. And I said, you know what, that's what I'll talk about today. I want to do, I want to talk about story and story selling, and I'll show you what I do. And I'm telling you, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. If you learn this skill, I'm telling you, if you learn this skill, what I'm going to teach you is the framework. But if you learn it, you will increase your sales ability like, uh, like that. Not just, uh, I'm talking like, uh, because it is the ability. Remember, we're human beings. We're used to sitting around. If you go back to, back in the day, I'm talking back in the day. We're talking caveman. We sat around the fire. We told stories. People remember stories. And what we're doing when we're selling we're presenting a product, we're presenting a service, what are we doing? We're telling a story. A story has narrative, but we wanna make sure that the story sticks, right? And so what I wanna do is give you today a framework for you to begin to incorporate story selling into your presentation. So I combine those two words, to me they mean know how to tell a good story that sells something that you're offering. Now, let me slow down here, because when I talk about selling, I'm expanding the definition. Typically, we talk about selling a product, right? We talk, or we talk about selling a service. But sometimes, you have to sell, if you're a manager, you want to convince your team that they can achieve a certain goal. Or maybe if you're coaching people, you got to sell them on the go. Or sometimes, you have to sell an idea, right? I don't know. Sometimes, you have to sell a vision. Or, last but not least, sometimes, sometimes, you have to sell that energy, that enthusiasm. Get people fired up like, yeah. You know what I mean? You ever see those movies? Like I was watching the other night, uh, what is, uh, what's the movie with Denzel Washington, uh, The Titans? 
If you watch the movie The Titans with Denzel Washington, give me a one. Or just put Denzel. So I think it's The Titans, something The Titans. And there's a, there's a speech that he gives, you know, where they had the, um, uh, uh, a big civil war battle, I forgot. I think it was the Battle of Gettysburg. And again, so sometimes you have to sell that energy, that passion. So this is all the stuff we sell. We sell products, we sell service, we also sell goals, ideas, you know, visions and energy, right? So did somebody get the movie? Yeah, remember the Titans. Thank you, Steve. Bingo, That's, that was the movie. Love that movie, right? Uh, I love Denzel Washington, man. I, I just love Denzel Washington. So, uh, you know, King Kong ain't got nothing. No. Yeah, anyway, you know what movie. Uh, so anyway, stay focused, Victor, stay focused. Uh, yeah, by the way, I had a troubled kid. I had like ADHD since I was a kid. So I've noticed that a lot of salespeople have ADHD, by the way. So anyway, back to the topic at hand. So this is all that we're selling sometimes. I mean, we're really selling a lot. We're selling products, service, ideas, vision. That's what we do. And sometimes you can give people facts, right? And I'm giving you the basics right now. Let me just lay some foundation. We know that I can, if this is the brain, right? We know there's the logical part. I've talked about this. There's the emotional part. And then there's the survival part of the brain. But this part right here is what we know as system one. This is system two. System one is the emotional piece. That's the part that just really you know, gets you going. Then we rationalize it logically, system two. Most of our decisions are system one decisions, right? And so, again, we can be logical, but storytelling really hits this part of the brain. That part of the brain that just fires people up, gives them the courage to make that final decision. Remember, sometimes people already logically have thought about what they want to do. They just need an emotional nudge to get them over the line. So what I want to do is share with you when I'm talking, when I'm presenting, when I'm pitching, or when I'm doing a large keynote on a big stage, I'm going to give you my secret for developing content. And it's a really simple formula. And then I'm going to give you examples and we're going to dig into it. So here is the magic formula for story selling. First of all, and you can change the order, but let's just start out. You're going to tell a story, right? We're going to tell a story. And we're going to work through some stories. I got three stories we're going to work through together to give you an example. Then that story is going to have a point. Now that point has to be like a point, like, ah, you got to get that. And then the last part is the application piece. In other words, telling a story, making a point is one thing, but then how does it apply to you? So if I'm talking to a buyer and I just told them a story, with a key point, now I have to say, now here's how this applies to you. Because telling a story with a point is great if you're just storytelling and we're just hanging around and you're drinking. But if I want to sell, I gotta say, here's how it applies to you. By the way, the way I remember this is I use this acronym, SPA. So you wanna give people the SPA treatment. I thought that was clever. I thought that was cute, but that was just me. But anyway, so when we're, when we're telling a story, we wanna give people the SPA treatment. So. Let's go through some examples, right? And so I've got three stories for you. And, and by the way, never, never tell a story by starting out, hey, I'm gonna tell you a story. Now I'm gonna do it here because we're just kind of doing this workshop thing here live. But when you're talking and speaking, you don't say, let me tell you a story. You know, you just, you have to come up with a soft way to go into it. So a man walks into the doctor's office when was the last time you went to the doctor's office? I want you to take yourself back to that. You went to the doctor's office. Man goes into the doctor's office and doctor says, what's wrong? Man says, I'm hurting everywhere. The guy says, I'm hurting everywhere, right? And the doctor says, what do you mean you're hurting everywhere? He says, he says everything hurts equally as bad. He says, everything. And the doctor's kind of confused because the doctor's never seen it. You know, these symptoms before, you mean everything's hurting the same with the same magnitude and intensity. He says, yes. He says, really? He said, well, do me a favor. So he said, take your finger, touch your head. So the guy touches his head and he goes, ah, pain. He says, doctor's looking at this like, wow, that's pretty interesting. He says, well, touch your neck. Guy touches his neck. Ow, he screams again, right? The guy said, well, well touch your chest. Touch his chest. Ow, that hurts too. Touch your stomach. Ow, goes all the way down to the thigh. Ow, all the way down to the knee. Ow. And the doctor says, I think I found your problem. And the guy says, what? He says, you have a broken finger, right? Broken finger. Simple story, kind of funny. Again, let's not judge my stories on humor right now. It's just a story. 
Now, let's deconstruct that story. Because if I'm telling that story from the stage, first of all, I wouldn't drop it cold like I just did right now. I would weave it into a longer narrative, right? I would slide it in. But when I would tell a story like that, if I were to tell a story, that story on stage, I would say, look, man walks into the doctor's office, tells a whole story, finds out his finger's broken, right? And then you say, now we gotta go, so we've just told the story, right? And the story is, we'll call this the man in pain. The man in pain. The man in pain story. I tell the man in pain story, and the point is he had a broken finger. That was the real problem. It wasn't all of this. And then I can now make a point. Here's where I can introduce a point or a learning moment. Now, how would you use a story? How would you use a story to make a point? Here's what I came up with, and then you can put yours in there if you like, what you would do. The way I would use this story, because when I hear stories and they have these type of twists, like, ah, it was actually his finger that was broken. That was the real pain point. I would use it to make the point that sometimes we focus on the wrong things when we're trying to solve something, when really it's just one thing. And if we focused on that one thing, we could solve our other problems. For example, there's a phrase in business called high leverage activities. A high leverage activity is if you did this activity, if you did this one activity, you would solve five to 10 of your problems. That's called a high leverage activity. So I would use this in a high leverage activity scenario. So I would say something like this. I would say, after I told the story, I, I would say I would make the point, too often we think that we have many problems, but in reality, we just have one problem, right? And that's how I kind of summarize that. We think we have many problems, but we have one problem. Now, watch how I make this apply to you. Now, I'm gonna make it apply to you. Let's say you're in sales and I'm training you, right? I'll say, so let me just do it again. Let me go through slowly. I tell the story. It's your fingers broken, right? Then I make the point. Too often we think that we have lots of problems, but in reality, sometimes we just have one big problem that we haven't identified. And if we can solve that one problem, like fixing the finger, we can solve the rest of the issues. Now, how does this apply to you? Many people tell me, said, Victor, my sales are hurting. Notice I use the word hurting because I'm using the story with pain, right? Many people tell me that their sales are hurting. And when I dig deeper, I realize that the only reason, because I ask them, why are your sales hurting? Some will say, Victor, it's the product we're selling. Victor, it's the service we offer. Now, Victor, it's just that our process is too complicated. Victor, our customer service isn't that big. Victor, it's this. Now notice, I just identified five things, right? But notice what I'm doing is I'm tying it also to what I did with the body, right? Head. Sometimes we think it's customer service. Sometimes we think it's the product. Sometimes we think it's da-da-da. Sometimes we think it's da-da-da. Sometimes we think it's da But the real problem is that may, in all these cases, when I talk to sales teams and I look behind what the real problems are, much like the doctor found the real problem, I usually find the problem. And the problem that most sales teams have is prospecting. They don't have a sales problem. They have a prospecting problem. They don't know how to find the right clients. Do you like that? Because that was pretty good. Come on, you got to admit, that was pretty good if you think about it, especially if you're coming off the cuff like that. That was pretty good. And so what happens, so, but in all seriousness, notice what I did. This is a really interesting way to layer a story because what I did is I started out with the story of the man in pain. And if you remember, I'm going to get visual here. I'm going to get visual here. Pain here, pain here, pain here, pain here, pain here. And I could come up with one, two, three, four, five. And I would do this on purpose, by the way, in my head. In my head, I would say, you know, touch your head, touch your neck, touch your chest, touch your waist, whatever, and touch your knee. Five things, right? Now, I would make the point that it's really just one thing. And we'll call that a high leverage activity, right? Now, how does it apply to you? This is where I pivot the story. And then I say something like this. When I work with sales teams and I ask them, why are your sales hurting? Back to this, they usually say, Victor, it's my sales process. And then what I would do from the stage, I would do this. Sometimes they say, it's my sales process. Sometimes they say, it's my product. Sometimes they say, it's customer service. Sometimes, 
so forth. But in the end, and I'll hold my finger up like this, the real problem is, is prospecting. They're not talking to the right clients. Because if you're talking to the right clients, then you have the right product. If you're talking to the right clients, you'll also have the right sales process. If you're talking to the right clients, and these are your clients, customer service knows how to deal with them, so you alleviate all the other problems. So then, I've just set this up as a prospecting problem using a story. And that's how I run that in parallel. Does that make sense? Hit me up if that makes sense with a big one, or let me see what the comments are. So yeah. Spa into yeah, HLAs, you get it, man. Brian gets it, you guys get it. So it's one of those ways that you can use stories. But notice what I did is I set up a story that ran in one direction and then I tied it into what I really wanted to talk about, which was prospecting, okay? So let me do a second one, because we're gonna do three of these, man. We're gonna do three of these and you're gonna figure out how I build stories on stage. This is exactly how I build stories. I'll sit there and just go, Okay, how do I tie that into that? That into that. Here's a story. Here's the point. Now, how do I figure out the application? Uh, cool. Thank you very much, by the way, for the feedback. So let me do story number two. Okay, story number two. Story number two. And again, you don't say, hey, let me tell you a story. Don't do that. But he says, and you could just start out the story. I said, mom takes out her kid to the playground. Kids having fun, having a good time, just running around. And then you can actually re relate this to, I said, how many remember those days where you were you played in, in the playground? <sighs> people raised their hand, right? I said, how many do you remember how, like having a sandbox or something? Some people raised their hand. How many remember loving the feeling of playing in the dirt? Raise your hand. And people are gonna say, everybody's plays it in the dirt. I said, I said, well, this little young man was running around, played, having fun. And after an hour or so, he realized that he lost his contact lens. Right, because he had contact lenses, so he lost his contact lens. So he starts looking for his contact lens. And after about two minutes, after about two minutes, notice I'm emphasizing two minutes, right? Just keep that in mind. After about two minutes, he said he can't find it. He gets frustrated. He runs to his mother and he says, Mom, and he's, he's panicking. He's, he's feeling really bad, but he says, Mom, I lost my contact. I was playing over there. I lost my contact. Mother runs over there. Mother runs over there, and within seconds, she finds the contact, right? Now, by the way, you can, you can stretch these stories. So let's, let's kind of play with the story a little bit. Kid is actually digging. Two minutes might not be long enough. Let's say he was, he was trying to find the contact lens for 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay? Kid's digging, trying to find his contact lens for 30 minutes, can't find it. Because he doesn't want to go back to his bus. He spent 30 minutes looking for this contact. And then he goes back, and what happens? Tells his mother, mother decides to come back. Mother looks and she finds the contact within one minute. So let's set the story up. Let's set the story up. Loss of contact, right? You guys with me? Loss of contact, right? Lost the contact, mother found it, right? And the little boy asked, let me finish the story. The little boy asked the mother, mom, how were you, how were you able to find it so quick? And the obvious answer is, son, we had two different motivations. You simply wanted to find it. I saw $250 worth of contact lenses, so my motivation was higher to look for it, you know, to really dig for it and find it. So what I would say is that I would tell the story, and what's my point? That you can have two people looking for the same thing, but the person that's most motivated will actually look harder, right? So the person, Two people looking for the same thing in the same pile. One didn't see it, searched for 30 minutes. The other who was super motivated, the mom, because they knew if they didn't find it, they'd have to pay 250 bucks. She was motivated, she found it. Because she was motivated to find it because she knows how much that contact lens costs. And so the point here is that, again, lost the contact, kid couldn't find it, right? Calls the mother, mother finds it in less than two minutes. Kids were searching for 30 minutes, couldn't find it. Now, how does it apply to you? Now watch how I, oof, Shift it again. So now I got to turn this because if you tell the story, that's a great story. And people go, that's a, nice, that's a nice story. That's kind of funny, but how does it apply to me? Now I pivot. Remember, story, I make a point. And now again, I'm just imagining my audience because you got to know your audience. I'm talking to sales managers or salespeople, right? Now, how does it apply? Let's say I'm talking to sales managers. Let's say I'm talking to sales managers. Here's what I would say. I would then, after telling the story, I said, now, managers, let me ask you a question. 
One of your biggest complaints is that your salespeople are not finding enough opportunities in the field. They're not digging or looking hard for opportunities. And then you go out there and you find them, but they can't seem to find them. And the reason is that much like the kid, they're not motivated. They're not motivated like the mother. So my question to you is, is your compensation plan for your salespeople rich enough to make them want to find that $250 contact? Because in your business, every prospect they find represents $25,000 to your bottom line. So my question to you is, have you compensated them enough for them to really want to dig, look for good prospects? See what I mean? Same thing, same thing. Are you starting to get the rhythm here? So same thing, right? Okay, you guys have a side conversation. But anyway, do you get the idea? So again, I made the story, dropped a point, and then I dropped the application. And I tied it back into prospecting again. What am I saying? They're not prospecting. One last story, then I'll take some questions uh, if you have any on this topic. Because I want to see how you would use it. Excuse me, like if you have a story, how do you develop it? All of us have stories. Everybody on here has a great story. You have multiple great stories. If I were to interview, I'd pull all kinds of stories out. And so what I try to do is I try to find simple stories or examples, analogies, whatever it may be. And then I said, how can I use that in a story so I can sell something? Now notice that when I'm doing this, I'm telling a story and when I drop the point, that's great. But when I show people how it applies to their thinking, it shifts their brain. They go, I never looked at it that way, Victor. I, you know, I got the story of losing the contact, but I never tied it into, am I compensating my salespeople enough for them to be motivated to dig and find quality prospects? One more example. So, story again, point, and then we'll go back to this, okay? I didn't want to forget this one. All right, now, let's say that when I was in engineering, I used to design wireless systems. I don't know if I told you that, but I started out as an engineer, right? I was designing wireless systems, right? So, uh, this is the curvature of the earth, right? Curvature of the earth. And one of the things I realized that if I put a tower here, with an antenna, right? If I put a tower there with an antenna, it's a tower with an antenna, it would shoot the signal like that. And then if I had another tower over here that had a receiver, so this is a, let's say this is a transmitter that's a receiver, it would actually overshoot that and it would never receive the signal. Basic engineering, we all learn about the line of sight. In other words, for an antenna to talk to another antenna, it has to have a line of sight. It has to be able to see the other one. Because they're on opposite sides of the curvature, they can't see each other. And I would actually draw something like this on stage. So what we as engineers had to do was actually put in another one, an extra tower. This required that we put in an extra tower. What did the extra tower do for us? If we put a tower here, it repeated, we were able to, this one can see this one. There was line of sight. They could see that one. And then this one can see that one and it would just repeat the signal there because there was line of sight. Now that's just an analogy, an example, right? So line of sight example. What's the point here? Is that in order for this to reach this, you have to have what? Another antenna close enough where you have line of sight where you have line of sight. Everything in life is about line of sight. So now my point there is that if you want somebody to start believing, now first of all, let's go back to the story. The story is, here's how line of sight works. What's my point? In order for this antenna to communicate with that antenna, it first has to be able to see an intermediate antenna and go through that one because it can see it. It has to have a line of sight. Now, here's how it applies to you. Many of your salespeople, again, assuming I'm talking to salespeople, I said, many of your salespeople, when you give them a quota, a number they have to hit, in their minds, what they're often seeing is this right here. They're seeing basically, let's say, and then again, I would redraw this very quickly. Let's say that this year they had to sell, last year they sold 2 million. But now you're telling them that they have to sell 20 million. I'm making these numbers up, by the way, right? That sounds unreasonable. Let's say 10 million, 10 million, right? The reason they're not motivated 
is that because they can't see, they have no line of sight on how they're going to actually get there. They have no line of sight. They don't see it. They can't see it and because they can't see themselves getting there. They don't believe it. So we as managers, what we have to do, notice I'm applying it to them. What you have to do is give them intermediate goals because a salesman can believe that they can probably get to 4 million. So let's get them to 4 million first. And let's say, let's focus just on getting you to 4 million. And then once you get to 4 million, you set up another intermediate goal to get them to six. And then maybe then we can get them to 10 because from two to six, I have line of sight. And when I have line of sight, I believe that I can reach that. I can get that. But too often we give them quotas where there is no line of sight and they simply don't believe that they can actually sell that. So my question to you is, do you have intermediate goals, right? By the way, do you have intermediate goals or targets that they can hit to actually reach their number? See what I mean? Same formula all the way through. So if you look at all three stories, here's how I organize my stories and my content. So what I would do is I have an Excel spreadsheet and on my spreadsheet, it looks something like this. I'm going to show you what my spreadsheet. Under this column, I put the story. Now, the last one was more like an analogy, but you get the idea, right? What was the first story I told? The first story I told was the, I'll just call it the, uh, the broken finger one. I like the broken finger, right? The broken finger. What was the point in the broken finger? Do you remember? Uh, we think it's a lot of things when it's really just one thing, the high leverage activity, right? So here's my point, right? And the application I used it was, the application was prospecting, right? That the real problem that they have is prospecting, right? And then here I would put whatever notes. I would write notes for myself and that's how I do it. You ever see football, uh, football coaches off to the side is that they always have a play card and they're running different plays, you know, you know, they're running plays. My spreadsheets are like playbooks. So I know that I can use this broken finger story, da, 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 if I want to talk about prospecting. The second story was we talked about the lost contacts, right? Lost contacts, right? The point here was motivation was high, right? Motivation was high, but how did it apply? Are your salespeople compensated enough? Motivation was high. If motivation is high, people will look for it. But I asked them, what's your compensation plan look like? Are you paying your salespeople enough money? And the third story, which was really an analogy, the line of sight, the point here is they have to believe in their goals, right? And then are you setting reasonable or intermediate goals, right? And then I put notes here. Now imagine that you have, because I do, I have a bunch of these. I got, I think I have in my list, I have about maybe 80 or 90 of these, like not exaggerating, 80 or 90 of these stories in my head, right? And so when I'm looking at speaking, when I'm looking at training and sometimes I need a story, I go, yeah, I need something to tie the story together. I go to my play sheet. I go, let me, I, I really just pull it up on my computer and I see the Excel spreadsheet and I go, oh yeah, I forgot about that story. So then I'll just pick a story, I'll grab that story. And then I'll look at my content, I'll say, yeah, I can use that story as well. And so that's usually how I build my story selling when I'm selling. So if I'm selling somebody on something, I said, what stories can I use to drive home my point? Anyway, that is what I had for you guys tonight. And we did that in about 20, 23 minutes. So you guys have any questions on this? Anything on this that you have? Let me see. Uh, I got to go back to all these questions. Uh, it's your stuff in today's economy. I'll start from here because Jesus Enriquez, how do you build your stories based on your own experiences or do you have a source where you get them from? The best one, Jesus, are from your own personal experience. And it's, it's funny because sometimes it's like right now, if you told yourself, be aware of all these personal experiences. Like, um, you know, one of my, my most recent ones where I went to buy a drone at Best Buy and the guy didn't know anything about drones, right? I said, oh, there's a story there somewhere. So I like, okay, there's a story there somewhere. Or I go visit my cousin or my aunt 
and something happened, I go, there's a story there somewhere. So I'm always thinking to myself, where's their story? So I would use personal experiences because when you use personal experiences, it just like feels so much better when it comes out of you and it feels so much natural, uh, uh, so much more natural. Keep this in mind though, Jesus. This is a, uh, 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 an interesting thing to think about is that when you use personal stories, nobody can copy them. Nobody can copy them, right? Too often I hear speakers, and when I say too often, I mean a lot. I hear a lot of speakers use stories that I've heard like a hundred times before. For example, if I hear the, how many times did, uh, I don't know, who's the guy that, with the light? Uh, God, I forgot, the light, the light example. How many times did he fail before he invented the light, right? And he failed, he failed 10,000 times, but he failed, he failed 9,999 times before he finally succeeded with 10,000, right? And I'm thinking of Alexander Graham Bell, but I know that's not the guy. Uh, and then there's the uh, Colonel Saunders Kentucky Fried Chicken story, right? He started when he was 55 and he had all these failures. Or the Abraham Lincoln story, where they list out all these failures and then you realize that eventually you became president. That's Abraham Lincoln. Or you hear the Michael Jordan story, how he was cut from his high school team, right? You hear these stories all the time. And then when you hear another speaker use them, they lose credibility in my eyes because it's like, that's not even your story. And I've heard that story a hundred times. So that's why I think using your own story, Jesus, is probably the best way to go. So sorry for the long answer, but hope you got that. Admit, you digging that? Uh, let me see some other stuff going on here. Find a way to beat the uncontrollables. Uh, this can also be applied. So corporal critter, this can also apply to talking to salespeople who aren't producing on a high producing team. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. This could be, you can use this so many applications. And so every one of you has, I'm guessing every one of you has at least 10 good stories. Guaranteed, you have 10 good stories, right? Uh, and sometimes you don't know it's a good story, so you start telling a friend a story. And like, for example, uh, my Spanish friends will love this, especially my Puerto Rican friends will really love this. Uh, my mother, well, I always joked that he used to spank us with la chancleta. Remember the chancleta, the sandal? And I remember I told that story one time about how my mother, you know, when she threw the sandal at you, it's just like it had radar. It could find you and hit you, right? And people started laughing. I go, hmm, maybe there's a story there. And then I now use that chancleta story. You know, it's, it's another story, but I won't get into it. But just that experience is how could I use that story to drive home a point? And I was able to do that. So stories are everywhere. So yeah, uh, Asimov, Asimov, double A. It's all good, honestly, but how does it apply to actual salesmen? There's not much scenario where client has all body hurting or not motivated enough to buy from me. Again, I'm just giving you one example. That's a story. All I'm doing, remember, it's not so much the story I just told you, Asimov. It's really the formula I gave you. Find a story that relates to what your customer is going through, that you can draw a parallel. You don't have to use my stories. Uh, I'm just giving you examples. Find your stories. Find stories. And that's one of the things we don't do, and I think you can do it, man. You can find a great story, I'm telling you. Uh, Steve said it's called the hypothetical scenario. It is. Uh, Good overview on storytelling and more importantly, on how to apply them. Creates interest and aids in targeting into the issue at hand. It also does something on top of that, Brian. Uh, when you're telling these stories, this is important. People can't focus. And I've talked about this in past live streams. People can't stay focused for a long time. So one of the things I like to do is every, and, I, and again, this is just a number I use. Every five, seven, or 10 minutes, these are my numbers. Every five, seven, or 10 minutes, depending on the content, I insert a story. Because I know by inserting a story, it's almost like letting their brain relax. Oh, he's telling a story. Their brain relaxes, but here's what's interesting. Not only does their brain relax because they're absorbing information, and then you start telling a story, you can feel their brain relax, but also you can actually see them like leaning into the story, especially if it's a compelling story. If it's a compelling story, they lean in, but also their brain relaxes. It almost re-energizes them. And as you, after you tell the story, you drop the point, and then how does it apply to them? You drive more content. And so what you're doing is you're mentally cycling the people through your presentation. So keep that in mind that that's how I would use it as well. Uh, thank you very much. The GOAT, I don't know about that, but thank you very nice. Blitz TV, love it, man. Back to your technology days. Once in a while, I gotta go there. All right. 10,000K in digital 
I have no idea what that means, but Mikey Maine. Sounds, sounds like a singer, man. Mikey Maine. And next, on the stage, Mikey Maine. I love that. Kanishka, how can I get, order your book on sales modeling, Victor? Do you have a PDF we can access? Uh, it's on Amazon, so you can get it there, okay? So check that out. And if, you, if that's the problem, let me know. Uh, I love the play sheet setup. It is a great tip, man. It is a great tip. Alani, thank you very much, man, for the feedback. Uh, Corporal Curl gets it. I, this is money. I need to start a spreadsheet for my different situations I ran into. Yeah, great idea. I tend to live in Excel anyway, is that you can't remember all these stories, right? And so, by the way, you'll be amazed. Uh, I have another friend who uses PowerPoint. And was by, the way he uses it uh, is that he just writes a story and how it applies in the actual slide, and then he creates a bunch of slides. The reason I don't like that approach is then I got to go through all the slides. When you have like a, on a spreadsheet, you can literally just glance and see about 20 or 30 stories very quickly. But it's a really powerful approach. This is not taught, you know. So anyway, uh, I do B2C sales and have issues building rapport. Doctor, what would you advise? On the building rapport piece, let's st try to stick to this topic at hand. Sometimes the building rapport is because, you know, we're not relaxed. We're too businesslike. We're not natural, right? And we don't tell a story. And so one of the things I challenge myself to do, Blake, I'm going to challenge you to do this. I do this all the time, and I wish I could drag my wife in front of the camera because she would just say, yes, she does this. When I meet somebody, like I get into an elevator, and I know that I'm going to ride at least two or three floors, I always ask myself, how can I start a conversation? I'm like, I just I try to master the art of starting conversations. Uh, this morning, true story, just to give you an idea, Blake. So... I'm, I'm walking the dog, right? And two people are coming my way. And it's always that awkward, you know, morning situation, you know. So they're coming my way. And as they were walking towards me, it's, a, it's an older couple. I said to them, I literally said this to them, Blake. I said, clear the path. I just said it real loud. I said, clear the path. Vicious dog coming through. I said, and my dachshund is about, if you've seen Pebbles, she's like this small. And all I said, clear the path. There's a vicious dog coming through. Just please move to the side. And they literally started laughing, right? Because it's such a small dog. And they literally stopped and they said, hey, how you doing? They wanted to pet the dog. They said hi. And it was just a beautiful, friendly, you know, encounter. Because I was relaxed, I made them relax. You got to remember, Blake, they're nervous. Whoever you're talking to is really nervous. They don't know what to say either. So why don't you step up, be more relaxed, tell some stories. And it's okay to drop a little humor here and there. No jokes. Just humor, big difference, right? Einstein, I'll take that. Was it Einstein or, no, it was Edison. It was Edison. Relatively, relatively, uh, dag, okay. Thomas Edison, okay, so, okay, a bunch of Zig Ziglar on failures. Because Zig Ziglar used that story, right? And so again, when you hear these stories, that's why I think back to Jesus's question, when you use your stories, I think they're the best stories. Uh, okay, Edison, okay. I'll say you did correct yourself, so my man. All right. How would you introduce a personal story when you're in a cold? Oh, it's a good question here. This is, I like this one, Jeffrey. This is like, it's on topic and it's a good one, man. So let's do this one. So on a cold call, you know, remember the, the tricky part of a cold call is that I don't know if I would introduce a story right away because I'm trying to grab their attention on a cold call, right? So I don't know if I would introduce a story, but... You know how in a cold call you can pivot. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Anthony. I represent a company that works with your industries and we typically help companies, you know, in your ABC industry, increase sales by 10 to 20%. My question to you is, are you the person I should be talking to? And they're gonna, and let's just say that they are, yes I am. And then here's when they say, yes I am. And that's where you have an opportunity to insert some humor. And you can just say, and again, I'm just talking out loud here, but that's where they said, yes, I, I am the person. I said, I'm so glad I found you. Uh, finding you was almost as hard as finding my wife. Do you know what I mean? Or something that just kind of breaks the ice a little bit, right? Just breaks it just a little bit. Uh, I work with a client who uses humor in a very interesting way in this, to set up the meeting. For, they make the cold call, and then to set up the meeting, he, he does this. Towards the end of the call, he says, now, Listen carefully. He literally tells him, uh, listen carefully. I'm going to send you a $10 Starbucks card. Now, when you go to Starbucks, here's what I want you to order. And he says, order whatever type of coffee it is. And once you drink this coffee, this very special coffee, it's going to solve your 
financial problems, it's gonna solve your mental problems, and it's gonna solve your marriage problems, and it'll solve any problem you can think of. And he says when he started infusing a little bit of humor, because and he goes, the reaction, he said, Victor, is always the same. They start laughing because it's kind of funny. So it's a way of finding some humor to be natural. So hopefully that helps a little bit, but I, I would use it in the pivot, you know, once you find the right person. And so that's what I would do. Uh, what's the critical element that must be in every story? Great question, Rod. So Rod, if we're doing this whole spa thing, right, which is the, the story, so it's not just one thing, but let's see what each element has to have, right? The spa story is this, the spa. This story has to be, I don't want to use the word quick rod because it doesn't have to be quick, but it has to be a fast story. By a fast story, I mean, you know, it, it should take no more than two, two minutes to deliver. Let's just use that number, Rod, two minutes to deliver. Let me take this off for a second. It takes two minutes to deliver because if you're going to tell a longer story, there's a rule in storytelling that the longer the story is, the more you're demanding from the audience, the longer the story is, there better be a big payoff at the end. So this point that you're gonna make here has to be really good. But if I only invested two minutes in a story, then this point doesn't have to be that strong. You know what I'm talking about? That the longer the story is, like you ever have somebody just tell you a long story and you're like, this better, be, this better get good at the end because I'm, you know, this, is a long, this is a long story. So you don't wanna tell a long story, tell a fast story. Something that's, by the way, very bouncy, very cute, very apropos. And then the point, has to almost have a little bit of a aha to it. It has to have that little aha to it. Like for example, touch this, touch this, touch this. Ah, I see your prop, it's a broken finger. Again, if you didn't know the story, you go, oh, never thought of that, right? That's the aha moment, right? Uh, so when you're looking at the, uh, looking for the contact lenses, it's not a big aha that the mom found it. What the big aha is that she was motivated differently. That's kind of an aha. And then, then you pivot towards how it applies to them. And this should really tie. So. Quick story with a good aha is usually a good combination for using that. Uh, let's see what we have here. So Craig S. Ward, my son works for a large web company. Let me just see if I can shrink this a little bit. And is going back to the sales floor. What piece of advice do you have for him? If he's a large web hosting company is going back to the sales floor, uh, in, in any business in selling, uh, and I, I, I don't know if he's going to do inside sales or he's going to do outside sales. Is he going to be an SDR, you know, or, or BDR, business development rep or service development rep calling from the inside? I don't know. But let's assume that he's inside. On the inside, you know, I always say that there's three things they should always know, Craig. And I'm telling you, if, if people figure this out, you know, is that you got to know your product. So you got to tell him he's got to know what he's offering. He's got to know his client's business, really. And then he has to understand what's available in the market. And then right there is where he works, right? So I would say, man, understand what you're selling, understand what your clients really want, and then really focus on what's also available in the market. So when you're having these conversations with the client, do it. And I often recommend, you know, just have, teach your, teach your son to really have direct, friendly conversations. And I use those two words carefully, direct, but friendly conversations. I think the sooner he can get to that space where he feels comfortable talking to people, Craig, that's what he'll become a great salesperson. But if he knows his product, understands his customers, understand what's available in the market, and he can have that conversation, that's a great starting point. So hopefully that helps. Let me know if that did you any good. Uh, how to use story to pitch a potential investor? Oh, lovely question. By the way, uh, oh, what was his name? Um, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, I think it's called, I think it's Oren. By the way, can you guys look this up? So I, I don't have, it's Oren Cloth. And I think he wrote a book, Pitch Anything. Can you guys help me out with this? Can you look that up? Pitch Anything. Probably one of the best books I've ever read on pitching investors. By the way, it's helpful for sales as well. But look up. Oren Cloth. I mean, just a fantastic book. Rustam, I just say, just go read the book, Matt. It's go It's so worth the money. Okay, it's so worth the money, and it's more information than I can give you right here. But that right there is a great tip, man. Check that out. Uh, how can you make a team overcome the? Hold on a second. Uh, how can you make them overcome the COVID pandemic? 
And now that's such a big question. I don't know how, if I know how to answer that uh, because I don't know how you're trying to motivate them. Um, because, you know, I was in my, I don't know if you were in the last one now, but I talked about how in the last session, I talked about different companies who are doing exceptionally well during this pandemic. I mean, they're just like killing it. The pool companies, the windows companies. Uh, I was just talking to another company. Uh, uh, I, I build a lot of wood pens, right? So I go to a wood craft store and I thought they were, and I just went over there about maybe four or five days ago. And this is since March, I haven't been there. So I just went there four or five days ago and I thought I was gonna hear the whole violin story, things are going back. He goes, we're 102% year over year. You know, they're doing well. So some industries are doing better than others. So I would need to know what industry they're in. And, you know, then really, if, if I were managing folks, I would try to figure out, you know, how can we win? Because that's what people are looking for. If you have a sales team right now that's deflated, that they're not motivated, what they want from you as a manager is they want a plan. They want a strategy. How are we moving forward? They're looking for you to guide them. People often think that you can motivate them. You're the best. You're the greatest. Let's stay positive. No. What motivates people is knowing what and how to do it. If they know what to do and you teach them how to do it, they're motivated to do it. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Owen Schrock, love your stories. Victor Antonio, let's get you on our new podcast soon. Love to do it, man. Let me know, my man. Let me know. I love it. Uh, what are ways to pull stories from people? Great question. What are ways to pull stories from people? Man, R and J recording studio Mendoza, man, you kind of stumped me on that one because I don't, have, I never, I don't think I've ever thought about that question. How do I pull stories? When I interview somebody and they say I don't have any stories, the way I do it, again, the way I do it is I usually start with their job experience, and I think one way to do it is say, tell me about, and this will be, this will be a good starting point for you. This is how I would approach it. I go, tell me about a bad experience, right? And then tell me about a great experience. And then tell me about a fantastic manager you had, right? Tell me who your role model is and why, right? Uh, tell me something about your parents. You know, something your parents did for you that just blew your mind, right? Something that just blew your mind, something that you didn't expect. And so those, that's where I would begin to try to find some of these stories. Uh, and then, you know, tell me about your childhood, you know, your first bike. You know, what was something that you got early on you know, that really surprised you, you know, or the story I often tell is, you know, uh, for example, I said, if you're married, I would say, you know, how did you meet your wife? And then there might be a story there. Trust me, there's a story in mine. I got a great story. Just how I met my wife. Well, that's a long story. That's, that's a podcast by itself or a video series, right? But hopefully that helps a little bit. I would ask these questions. Uh, but it's funny that, you know, if you just get into a natural conversation with people, they just tell funny stories. They just tell interesting stories. And then if you just dig a little deeper, and I think that the trick is listening and not interrupting people, just letting them talk and then asking key questions. I think you'll drag it out of them, if you know what I mean. Eminem is back. Victor, how can you recommend a good book on negotiation? Need one session on negotiation. Uh, I don't have a book off the top of my head. Uh, I do have a course in the Sales Velocity Academy. So again, if you go to Sales Velocity Academy, I got some great content in there. One that I could put my hand on the fire, because that's usually when I recommend a book to you guys, uh, realize that I'm only going to recommend the book that I would literally keep at, you know, my, I always talk about my golden bookshelf, the best of the best books. I have not found the best of the best negotiation book. You know, uh, the, one, the one that I do, oh, I, I, I do like one, even though it's not negotiation, Oh, it's it's uh, uh, never compromise, never, never split the difference. That's the one you want. Check out never split the difference. I think that's the title. If you know what, if you know the author, can you put it in there for him for Eminem? Never split the difference. Even it's it's really a book about negotiation in terms of like. Uh, you know, like like hostage, you know, and things of that nature. But it's a great book, and it has kind of a negotiation twist in there. So never split the difference, man. Try, try that out. All right. So hopefully that helps, Eminem. Uh, Elkin Orozco, hi, Vic. Quick question. How do you determine, how do you set a compensation plan, commission plan? Uh, what is too much and what is too little? You know what I'm going to do just for you, Elkin, because I think I kind of like you? Uh, I'm going to make that. Uh, Thursday's topic. How's that? 
that's a that's a great. I, it, by the way, I'm gonna do that as a separate topic only because that's gonna require 20, 30 minutes to explain. So join me next Thursday or this coming Thursday, and we're gonna do compensation plan. Thank you for giving me the uh, idea for the next one. I think that's a great one, man. That's a really good one. So. Hang in there. Can you apply one story for various points and applications? And what's your method for connecting the dots? Man, Rod, you are on me today. You're just like, Victor, I'm going to make you work. So I don't try to. So here's how I would handle it, Rod. Because, by the way, I want you to read his question. It's a really good question. It's a very good question. So, Rod, let's say you have to do, uh, and I'm just giving you my perspective how I do it. Let's say that I have a 40-minute pitch, right? If I have a 40-minute pitch... You know, if you've heard me long enough, uh, I develop all my, my speeches in modules, right? And just bear with me, these are each five to seven minutes. So let's say that this is a, so at most it's about a 30, 40 minute conversation, right? Could be more stories. And so within here, I would use an SPA story, right? Situation, problem, then how it applies. And then I would bridge it here and I would be fine. And then I got to build some bridges. But I would ask myself before I did the presentation, what's my storyline? What's my narrative? That's the key word, man. That's the key word. What's my narrative going into this presentation? So for example, let's say I'm offering some type of software solution, right? And that software solution is going to optimize their business, optimize their business. So I would use words like, okay, it's going to optimize their business. Optimize your business, which means it's also going to what? Probably increase, let me just do it this way, increase their profit margins. Why? Because I can probably increase their revenue and I can definitely reduce their costs, right? So my narrative throughout this whole thing would be about how I'm going to increase your revenue or reduce your costs by optimizing your business. And then each of these stories will be built around optimization. So this one could be, this first story could be how to optimize. This one could be how to increase revenue, and this one could be how to reduce cost. And then I land right here with my summary of the three things that our software can do. But notice that the whole narrative, this whole narrative here is profit margin, right? My whole storyline is profit margin. And I just tell three different stories and all driving towards the profit margin. Let me know how that works for you. That's a great question though, man. That is a real good question. Uh, it's like telling a joke to keep an engagement. Love the formula. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Brenda Blake. Brenda, I don't think I've seen your name up here before. Let me know if this is your first time. Hit me with one. Great. Uh, Rajiv, I know I've seen you before, I think. Blaming prospecting for failed sales while you could be ignoring some other problem with product or something else. True. I'm just using an example here. It could be prospecting, could be something else that's wrong. Whatever the point of that story is that they're focused on all this other pain, but sometimes it's just one thing. And it could be in your case, as you're saying, probably the product or maybe even the service. That's the real pain point. So to your point, well done, man. Uh, should you reverse engineer the result or point you want to make or fits the situation, then apply a story that fits. Your scorecard looks like it would be helpful to do that. Should you reverse engineer the result or point? So in other words, if you want to make a point, you're saying, I think I understand you're right. So if you're doing this whole thing right here, and it's a very good question, Brian, to bring it up, is that if you want, the thing is, I don't know if you could reverse engineer. Yeah, you could. If I start out with the problem, it's a good question you have. I can start out, what is their problem? Their problem is prospecting right? What's the point? Why aren't they prospecting? They're only focused on, they're focused on the wrong things, right? Wrong things. And then I can figure out, hey, I'll use that broken finger story. This is really harder to do this way. When you're doing it this way, Brian, which is, which is a good point, by the way, can be done, and I've done it. When you do it this way, Typically, you don't find a story. It's more like you'll find an example that fits, right? I think it's easier to go this way than this way. But it's happened to me where I go, you know what? I got to find a story. I got to come up with a way of explaining how prospecting is the most important thing. Do I have any stories in my arsenal? Do I have any data points? Do I have any case studies? And then I could work backwards. So you can do it that way. I think it's a little tougher, but 
Sometimes it's a necessity, right? And there is one of my favorite people. Love a cup of tea. Uh, I like use goes a long way. One story, I think one story I like to use that goes along with lines of when the tide goes out, you find out who's wearing or who's not wearing trousers. So love a cup of tea. That was a uh, Warren Buffett said. He says, when the tide goes out, you'll see who's swimming naked. And by that, he mean, you'll see who is not financially stable. So, yeah, I mean, again, even that's a great line you can use during a presentation. But again, you see the problem there, love a cup of tea, is that even I knew that and a lot of people know that. If you're doing a presentation and people already know the quote, people already know the story, you lose power from the front of the room. That's important to keep in mind, okay? But I hear you. I love that. It's one of my favorite. Uh, Kanishka, enroll at Sales Velocity Academy, lifetime plan. Boom. All the books by VA. Oh, by the way, that is true that if you enroll, I should mention this. Thank you, Eminem, for bringing it up. Uh, if you become part of the Sales Velocity Academy, all my books, all my 14 books are up there for free, especially my new one coming out. Uh, all that stuff's up there for free. Uh, uh, some of the manuals, uh, some of the learning sheets are up there. So there's a lot of content up there. So again, it's, it's a great deal, man. So check it out. Uh, good advice. Janderson Santos. That's a cool name, man. How you doing, man? Is that from France? Oh, hi from Brazil. Brazil. What part of Brazil, man? Uh, for common objections like price, what should a story be like? Mm, good one. So, for example, that one right there, common objections price. That one I like to use, even though a lot of people have used it, is the Zig Ziglar story. Where Zig Ziglar, this is a perfect example. I, I hear a story and I just store it into my spreadsheet, right? And so for that one, uh, Zig Ziglar has a story, and I'll give you the fast version uh, about price and cost, right? And the story is about a, about a kid who buys a bike, right? And so the guy says, that's more than I expected to pay, right? Somebody tells you that's more than I expected to pay. And so your response is, say, you can say, Mr. Customer, when you say that's more expected to pay, are you worried about cost? Or are you worried about price? Now notice, I took control of the conversation by asking a question. Mr. Customer, when you say that's more than you're expected to pay, are you worried about cost or are you worried about price? And now he's gonna say, well, what's the difference? Well, and then you're gonna say, a la Zig Ziglar, can't take credit for it. He said, Mr. Customer, see, price is a one-time thing. Cost is a long-term thing. Now, the way that Zig Ziglar tells it, is that he tells the story first about a boy who who wanted a bike. So his father didn't buy them the expensive bike, the Schwinn bike that cost, let's say, $70 at that time. Let's say $100, right? Instead, the father bought him a cheaper model because it was 50% the price. But after a week of using it, I'm making part of the story up. It, it goes something like this. After a week of using it, one of the tire goes flat, so they had to go back in and repair then a week later, this, one of the sprocket gets broken, so they had to go back in and repair it. By the time they take it in for the third repair, they've already paid more than they would have paid for the actual price of the, a better bike. He said, so if, if you're worried about price, price is a one-time thing. That's what you pay for quality. Cost is a long-term thing. Now, another way of using the story is that, think about it. When you're buying something, most people think about the actual, right there and then, what is the price? What they don't think about is that price is what you pay here, but then if you buy something cheap, it may break down. It may break down, and so the total cost, this is where you hear the phrase, let me just take this out here. Tarun, this is where you hear the phrase total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership is the real cost of something over a period of time. So I would use this story to talk about, look, you're going to pay a little more now, but in the long run, it's going to be much cheaper. So would you rather pay price or would you rather pay on cost? And most people say, I'd rather pay the price than pay a little more. Something like that. Just smooth it out a little bit more. Uh, let me see. Asimov, Asimov, double A. Can you come up with a story on the spot? If so, can you come up with one right now? <laughs> I like the way you guys like to challenge me. Well, you, guys not, you guys got nothing to do but say, let me challenge Victor. Let me see if I can really get him. Uh, can you come up with one that will focus on a point that is a good idea to spend more for higher quality? I just did. Bam. Done it. 
Asimov. I predicted it. I answered it before you even asked it. How's that, man? Uh, telling longer stories feels like waiting for the punchline of a joke. The longer it is, the less laughs or payback you get. That's exactly it. It's almost like a long joke. By the way, if you want to, uh, one of the things I do, uh, so two things. One is I like to listen to preachers because preachers have a way of telling stories, but they also have ways of using their voices. You know, just kidding. And by the way, when I say watch preachers, I'll watch any public speaker, but preachers, and I can only watch them for about 20, 30 minutes, so I can't watch them for that long. But one of the things I like studying, though, now that you bring this up, Brian, is I love studying comedians. Comedians are a great source of learning how to set up a story and knocking it down. Like, set up a story and then hitting them with the punchline. In your case, you would set up a story and then you would make a point. That's your punchline. Uh, so, my favorite, and so if you don't like swearing, don't watch this guy, but that's my guy right there. I like Bill Burr. I've, I've not seen... Uh, aside from, uh, and I can't remember his name right now, he passed away. The guy with the beard. Who knows the comedian with the beard? Uh, oh, you know who he is. And I know you'll tell me who he is. But Bill Burr is probably the best at setting up a story and just knocking it down. Yes, I personally think even better than Dave Chappelle. That's just me. Bill Burr has a way of telling a story that you just lean forward and say, where is he going with this? And then when he knocks the story down and you're like, oh, I didn't see that one coming again. So he's one of my favorite right now living. He is my favorite. And I love watching his specials uh, because he uses his voice. He uses his story and he uses his body to tell stories, to really get into the presentation. And I know that in business, you can't really do that. But that aside, you know, you can learn a lot by how he sets up a story, how he tells a story and then the punchline, which is the point you're going to make, and how you're like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Craig said, thank you very much. Thank you, man. Uh, what stories work better? Something with loss or tragedy or some with reward, positive or uplifting? Great question, Rod. On that one, you got to be careful. It's such a great question, man. You're, you're, you're just on fire tonight with questions, man. So, Rod, on that one, it's almost like you got to be careful. I, you know, I see people use the, the what I call the emotive you know, stories, you know, to draw, you know, to draw out that emotion, right? And I think if you do that in the wrong scenario, especially in business scenarios, uh, that people will feel manipulated. You ever feel manipulated when, you know, you hear somebody tell a story and you, you already know where the story is going. You know, it's going to be a tragic story and there's going to be some inspiring note at the end. And then when they start playing music in the background, that really kind of lets you know you're being manipulated. So I, I like inspiring stories. Another great storyteller that just blows my mind. I think he's, you know, and I don't want to say he's one of the, the, the better speakers out there, but he's up there, man. And the reason I admire this speaker is because he doesn't move and he doesn't use a lot of energy. He just stands there pretty much and you want to listen to him. And if you've never listened to Simon Sinek, I suggest he wrote the book, Find Your Why. Uh, leaders eat last, and the last one was a book, uh, the Infinite Game. And watch his presentation on the Infinite Game, or even his presentation on Start with Why. If you want to see a master storyteller, this guy is it. Uh, Simon Sinek always does this. By the way, when you watch them, watch what he does. He always does this. He'll say he'll he'll stand there still. He goes. In 1948, a man decided to cross the river. You know, and he does this all the time. You know, he, it's always a, a time period and he sets up the scenario and you're like captivated. Like, where's he going with the story? So watch Simon Sinek stuff. It's great. So I would use those type of stories, Rod, because his stories definitely always have a point and he's going to give you an application every time. So he's another great storyteller. And again, what I love about him is that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't use a lot of energy. Uh, Blake, you're welcome, man. It is Orrin Cloth, Pitch Anything is the number one for pitching. I'm telling you, man, that is a great book. Oh, and thank you very much. Uh, yep, you guys got it. Uh, Russian, you're very welcome, man. Kerry Banks Wright, hi. I think it's the first time I've seen your name, so welcome aboard, man. Uh, show empathy and relate quickly, but stay away from telling your own COVID-19 stories. Otherwise, the conversation gets off track. That has been my best avenue in B2C sales. Okay, that was for the question earlier. 
Great suggestion. Would never have thought about that. Yeah, but that makes sense. Vera Kartik from Malaysia. Welcome on board. Sean Strong, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. Owen Truck again. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, I like this. I like that you uh, brought this up. Uh, use the form. You can, again, it can be about family, what you do, what you do when you're not working, and what's the other one? There's a, uh, and then insert a method to start the conversation. Love it, man. Owen, thank you very much, man. Looking good in that blue tie, by the way. Uh, he will be working on inbound sales. He watched your response. His comment was that he needs to understand what is the marketplace. Thank you. So, Craig, the marketplace is like if I'm selling, uh, and again, I just use uh, whatever product. He's selling hosting, right? So, or c computing or let's say cloud, uh, anything that has to do with that business, right? Or, you know, maybe there's some data centers. That he's selling the services within a data center. I need to know what every objection my customer is going to have. That's what the market space is. For example, uh, have him look at the companies, right, that he's working with, the clients he's going to go after. So let me draw it one more time. So if I were him and I, if I wanted to study this, if I wanted to be the best of the best, Craig, you know, and pass this on to what I would do is I know my product or service that I'm selling, right? I also know that my client, right? And so I would do two things. One is I got to figure out what pressure is my client under? What pressure is he under? In other words, remember, our clients have what? End users, right? This is typically how it works. We sell a product or service to a client. They turn around and sell it to somebody else. So they're feeling a lot of pressure right here. And typically, they're feeling cost pressure, price pressure, but they're also feeling competitive pressure. They're being Competition is squeezing them as well, right? And they're getting bombarded by other companies who are offering similar service to your son. So these are all the things that they're feeling, right? And so if your son comes in and can have that type of conversation, say, look, I know what's available in the market and I understand your business because I've worked with enough clients or I've talked to enough clients where I know some of the pressure points that you're going through right now. Let me tell you how we could help you. And again, this is a conversation where he's going to have to position himself as the expert. I, I'm going to suggest you read that book or have him read the book, The Challenger Sale. The Challenger Sale is a must read. And by understanding his client, but then understanding his client's clients, the end users, he'll become a better salesperson. I know I'm giving you the short answer here, but that's where it begins. And then have the conversations. And if I may suggest, if I be so bold, have him join the Sales Velocity Academy. Give him that as a gift and get him going, Greg, because if your son can make money, then guess what? When, he gets, when you get older, he's going to take care of you, man. So it'll be a good investment. Trust me, I got kids on my own, so I know. I know. All right, so hopefully that was a good enough answer. It's, it's a great question, by the way. Uh, we can prepare a story for blocking objection, but if it is an objection raised in the meeting, which you don't expect, should you risk telling the story? No, do not tell the story. So Tarun's question is, if he's going to tell a story that blocks an objection, which is brilliant already, which is well done, man, well done, because sometimes a story can be used to block an objection, just like the bicycle example about not focusing on price, uh, rather not focusing on, on the actual price, but looking at the long-term cost. That's a way of blocking an objection. But if the objection never comes up or rarely comes up, I would never use the story. So never insert a story with an objection that if the objection is rarely brought up. Only use the most common ones. Great one. And by the way, there it is. Never split the difference. That is a fantastic book. That book is worth the money. That's made the golden shelf, man. That's boom. And I, but in my brain, I keep thinking it's, it's more of a, you know, I don't see it as a pure negotiation because he goes beyond that. So it's a, it's a great book, man. So Ebox Tenders, man, thank you. A couple of you put it up there also. Blake, thank you very much. Uh, RJ, perfect, man. You guys are on it again, man. Victor. Did you ever uh, give a conference in Canada? You should come. You'll like it here. Come to Montreal or Toronto. I'll be buying a ticket right away. Oh, I've been there, man. I've been there uh, several times. My favorite presentation was to the International Cemetery Cremation and Funeral Association. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, so I've been there many times, A, eh? and I've enjoyed it. I, I spent the, uh, I just did an event I think it was last October in a place called Deerhurst. Let me know. I think it's right outside Toronto, about an hour and a half. Be gorgeous. Canada's just gorgeous, man. So thank you, man. Uh, oh, and also, never. Uh, it, it was Voss on that one. Never split the difference. 
Uh, it's from the Black Swan Group, Omero. By the way, Black Swan is what we're going through right now, right? The COVID is a Black Swan. Uh, thank you, Brenda. Everybody just chimed in on that one. Uh, cup of tea, back. I have to go now. A possible client meeting. Go make your money. I have I have been in busy for two months and still struggling to sign up any, anyone up. I remain in the zone of disappointment. Oh, remember. By the way, she's been watching this. Come on, you got to come out the other side. Really enjoying your stories and skill. Thank you, love a cup of tea. You'll see this later if you come back. Uh, Elkin, you got it, man. So again, I think it'll be a good Thursday session. You have my commitment on that. We're going to talk compensation plans on Thursday. Just gave you a shout out on LinkedIn. Boom. Thank you very much, man. Uh, Peter Wolf. Look at this, man. You should be like an author, man. Some major author with a name like that, right? Peter Wolf. Either that or a director of a movie, man. Hey, man, I hear you. Got to go, man. Thank you for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'm going to start wrapping up. First time, just selling clothes, DM to DM, man. Okay. Uh, Rod again. Appreciate you, man. I'm going to start wrapping this up. Got it. Thanks. You guys. Oh, well, wait a minute. I got this guy. I got to just bring up. It ain't complete if I don't bring up Victor Tan. Victor, do you have time to talk about how to implement social media prospecting? No, Victor. That's such a good topic, though, because... Uh, I use it a lot. Uh, if you follow me on social media, you'll know. I'll give you the short version. I use everything in my arsenal. I use this, right? I use graphics. I use other short form videos. I use podcasts and I reshare them on anything. So, uh, but can I share with you a cool tool that you can use that I think you'll like? You should check out this tool. Uh, it's called E Clinchers. Now, I don't remember if it's an S or not an S, dot com. And eClinchers, it's like, a, I think it's like 49 bucks a month, uh, Victor. And it allows you to really program out your social media calendar, you know, a month or two in advance. And it gives you a very cool visual. And then after that, you know, you just set, hit it and go. Uh, you still have to create great content, but it's a, that's how I manage all my content coming out like that. So... I'll leave it at that. All right, guys, I got to get out of here. We've been out here almost an hour and 15 minutes. I told myself I'd keep it under hour. You guys are awesome. Thank you for joining me again. Join me on Thursday. We're going to cover the topic. We're going to do compensation plans on Thursday. And again, if you enjoyed it, hit the like button. Remember, the only favor I ask is that you share this with at least one person or like my man, and let's say, oh, give me at least a shout out somewhere so people know that this exists. Thank you very much, guys. And remember, selling ain't hard when you know how. Take care.